Hello everybody and welcome. I'm Emma Griffin, I'm the President of the Royal Historical Society and it gives me great pleasure to welcome so many of you to today's training session on working with history outside higher education, a guide to professions beyond academia. So as many of you know, the Royal Historical Society is the UK's learned society for the discipline of history. We support historians many facets of their work, both inside universities and outside. And one part of that work is supporting students and new entrants to the profession. But today's workshop is part of that long-standing tradition of training events that we run inside the RHS, mostly for younger historians at the start of their career. We've divided today's event into two sections and we're hoping for plenty of audience engagement. Do use the Q&A function um, in order to pose your question. I will address as many of them as I can to our speakers. So let's get started. I'll start by introducing our wonderful speakers today. First speaking is Dr. Tracy Borman, a historian, writer and lecturer who has worked for, Her for Heritage Lottery Fund, the National Archives and English Heritage. She is now Chief Curator at Historic Royal Palaces and Chief Executive of the Heritage Education Trust, a charity that encourages children to visit and learn from historic properties. Tracy is also well known as an author of histories of the Tudor period and of historical fiction. Her latest book is Crown and Scepter, a new history of the British monarchy, William the Conqueror to Elizabeth II. Following her will be Emily G, who is the Regional Director, London and South East at Historic England, the UK's public body for the historic environment, where she's worked since 2001, including as Head of Listing and London Planning Director. Among other roles, Emily is also on the Council of Camden History Society and is writing a book on Victorian and Edwardian lodge housing, lodging houses for working women. Dr. Hannah Ishmael is the Collections and Research Manager of Black Cultural Archives in Brixton. Hannah has recently completed a PhD in the Department of Information Studies at UCL on the development of Black-led archives in London. And finally, we'll be hearing from Kate Wiles, who is co-editor at History Today, the oldest history magazine in the world and an associate fellow at the Institute of Historical Research at the University of London. Her historical journalism includes articles for The Guardian, the BBC History Magazine, The New Statesman and Times Higher Education, as well as contributing regularly to History Today. Uh, Kate is also a specialist in medieval language and has worked as a consultant for film and television. So we're going to start uh, by listening to Tracy. Um, I'm going to hand over to you, Tracy. Hold on, make my screen bigger. There we go. Great, right, over to you, Tracy. Thanks so much, Emma. Well, I'm really pleased to be part of this uh, seminar, and it's lovely to see all the comments coming through from literally all over the world. Um, so, welcome. And um, I particularly welcome the opportunity to talk about careers outside of higher education for those who love history, because a moment I think will forever stick in my mind. Um, and that's when I was studying for my A-levels. So in England, that's when you're between 16 and 18. And um, I knew that I loved history, but I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and I remember going to see a careers advisor um, and he said, basically forget it. Um, you can do history as a hobby, but kind of get a proper job. <laughs> Unless you want to teach history, that's about the only option open to you. So I'm really pleased I didn't listen um, to that careers advisor, uh, because actually, I think there have never been more careers open to those who love history than at the present time. Um, so I would love to say that my career path was very beautifully planned from the beginning and that I knew exactly what I wanted to do, but it'd be untrue. Um, I studied history at the University of Hull, loved it, so studied uh, a second degree, a master's degree, loved that, so stayed on to do a PhD. And all the while, of course, this was deferring any kind of decision about what I was going to do with my life. Uh, but it was whilst um, studying for my PhD and looking in the careers library at Hull that I came across um, a, something about heritage, um, working in heritage. And a little light bulb kind of went on in my head and I thought mm, heritage management that sounds quite interesting and so um, I found out more and I volunteered I, I basically just wrote hundreds of letters to historic houses and organizations asking if, if I could just get voluntary experience and one of them said yes 
And that would be one of my top tips, actually, not want, wishing to stray into um, into you know later on in this workshop. But but if you can volunteer and get experience, it's so helpful. Um, and then when I finished my PhD, I moved down to London and got whatever job I could in heritage and kind of gradually worked my up, way up that way. Um, and I'll be saying a bit more about that later. Um, and now, as Emma said, I am Chief Executive of the Heritage Education Trust, so we encourage children to visit and learn from historic properties. Uh, we are a charity, very, very small charity, um, and I'm also Joint Chief Curator of Historic Royal Palaces, and the curators are essentially the historians of these amazing palaces, um, five in London, one in Northern Ireland. They include the Tower of London and Hampton Court and Kensington. So that's pretty much a dream job for a historian. Um, so um, I will be saying more about um, the sort of specifics of working uh, for historic royal palaces. But I've sort of got two other strands that I just want to mention. Um, as Emma said, I'm also an author. Um, I've written, I think, 14 nonfiction books and three fiction. Um, historical, obviously. Um, and um, I, I'm really happy to share my experience of that as well. It's something that I've been doing for about 18 years now. I absolutely love it. Um, I would say there is no finer way to spend your time if you love history than researching and writing books. And again, with that, um, the way in for me was to just get whatever experience I could. So I started off by writing for history magazines and you know, just writing anything for anyone who would who'd be willing to spend the time and read it. Um, and then I developed an idea for a book, a biography of Henrietta Howard, who was the mistress of George II, um, and um, was lucky enough to get signed up by a literary agent, because that's what you need to do really, rather than send it straight to a publisher. And I'm still with that same agent um, kind of 18 years on and um, and now kind of writing fills probably more than half of my time and giving talks on my books that's the other thing that takes up an increasing amount of my time I've just literally got off the train from Devon where I was talking at a very beautiful literary festival there so that's a very fun part I think of writing books is getting to talk about them uh, to people all over the world, thanks to events like this, uh, but also in person across the UK um, as well. And then the broadcasting. Um, so I now um, do quite a lot of work on television, uh, taking part in history documentaries, presenting some of those um, documentaries. And that was not something I sought out. I'll be completely honest. I didn't set out to be a TV historian. That really arose from my books. Um, because if you become known for something for a particular specialist area, and it, particularly if you publish in that area, then you will find that TV researchers will start to contact you and ask you um, for advice on a series they're preparing or ask you to actually contribute to that series. Um, and that's really how that has developed. And it's now become you know, quite a time consuming but entirely fun element um, of my uh, work. And um, there's a neat crossover because I do some of that work for Historic Royal Palaces. We film a series called Inside the Tower of London that I take part in quite a lot. But I also do some, some TV work um, just independently as a historian. Um, so there are numerous different parts. I've kind of talked about some of them. Um, but what I would say above all is that if you don't yet know, what you want to do beyond the fact that you are passionate about history, you love the subject, then please don't worry because that's exactly what I felt. And I really did used to stress about not knowing what I wanted to do or not having the confidence to kind of carve out any kind of history related career. Um, but, you know, just dip your toe in the water if you can, get some voluntary experience and make contacts. And I think it's never been easier to do that thanks to social media, you know, just follow historians, or, or other um, kind of history uh, career people who you admire and, and get in touch. And quite often they will uh, reply. Um, I certainly always try to. Um, so I, I hope um, that's a helpful introduction. Um, Emma, I'm very happy to say more at this point, but I also don't want to waffle on longer than is necessary. <laughs> that's absolutely wonderful, Tracy. And I'm sure that's probably going to be the theme of the day um, that 
um, these historical careers don't necessarily follow clear, obvious, linear, mapped out paths. And it's lovely to hear that, um, you know, the, the, the route that you took um, and could also taken you to a very good place in the end. So lovely to hear that. So next we have Emily. Um, Emily, um, as I mentioned, just to remind everybody, Emily works for Historic England um, and is here to tell us something about her experiences of working in the wider heritage section uh, sector. Emily, over to you. Great, thanks very much, Emma. Um, and that was lovely to hear that from Tracy as well, with former former colleagues a long time ago. So it's been nice to see you and, and lovely that you're all here and I'm really um, pleased to be a part of today. Um, so yes, my name is Emily Chi and I look after the London and Southeast region at Historic England, which is um, a place where I've worked for over 21 years. So my whole kind of grown up working life has been in that organization. Um, and it's perhaps worth just saying a little bit about Historic England, which we often refer to as HE, but I realised that that's not what the subject is about. You're talking about higher education when you say HE, but um, so if I slip into HE for Historic England, um, that's what I'm talking about. But we are the government's advisor on the historic environment. Um, and we're a public body, we advise on planning, um, we advise the government on what buildings should be listed, um, we provide practical and statutory advice on um, planning and helping people look after buildings, both owners and developers and local authorities. Um, we undertake research into places and, to, and into sort of vulnerable assets or building types. And we run heritage-led regeneration and grant programs, um, all with a view to helping improve people's lives through heritage, through the historic environment. Um, it's perhaps worth clarifying that we used to be part of English Heritage um, and we, we split as an organisation in, in 2015 and English Heritage became a charity at that point, looking after properties in their care, um, very much like the National Trust. And Historic England took on a new name at that point and we stayed the, the arm's length body advising government owners and the public. Um, so as the name and the role suggests, we obviously have a, a sort of an expert role in understanding and managing historic buildings, landscapes, um, and ancient monuments, including those at sea. Um, so in many ways, we are very much an organization committed to history. And so my, my working life is, is very much focused on, on history. That's the thread that runs through it all. Um, but of course, it's more than that. And it's very much about a sort of practical application of history and thinking about how, how we manage change, how we, um, how we sort of live in, in the historical world today and, and help that become a part of our lives. Um, and I'd like to say that at Historic England, we are very much committed to telling a fuller story about heritage. And that's something that has really been a, a, with me throughout the whole 20 years I've been here from the very beginning, from the sort of increasing shift and in focus on, on telling a full story of heritage, not just a heritage of, of country houses and castles, although of course they are hugely important, but thinking about the historic environment across, across the range and how it impacts on, on, on ordinary lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So, we very much thinking about history, history of the everyday, as well as the special. Um, and we're committed to thinking about increasing diversity, very much so, both within our organization, um, and it'd be really interesting to talk a bit about that later, perhaps, um, but also across the heritage sector more broadly. I think there's a lot of work we can do there um, together. We're also working hard to think about how um, we can show the role of heritage in helping to solve um, some of the, the major issues involved in climate change mitigation. Um, and also how heritage can help with the economy of places as well as well-being of communities. So um, that's just an example of some of our major priorities at the moment, but also just to give a steer of kind of how history can fit into these really broad practical applications, both in a practical sense, um, also an economic sense, and also a social, a social and public value sense as well. Um, Perhaps worth saying that in my role, I work very much closely with my own team and my colleagues um, within the organization, but also with local authorities and other agencies. We work closely with government. Um, we worked with, a, with a, a, the public, a very much committed and at terms concerned public. Um, we work with developers, we work with owners of buildings um, and with communities. So really broad range of audiences um, do I encounter in, in my, my daily work. And I think the sort of the communication skills that, that, that um, higher education bring are, are really important in helping to, to, to work with and communicate with all those different audiences. Um, so just a little bit about how I got here um, to end. I, I very much enjoy being a public servant. I think I always knew that I would work in the public sector. Um, I studied in the United States. I grew up there. So all my, all my academic training is there. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at a historic women's college in African-American studies. 
Um, and that was my very much sort of my, my focus, but it was mainly history as, as part of that degree. Um, in the summers, I worked with buildings. I worked as an apprentice laborer. I worked in historic landscapes at Monticello um, and became increasingly interested in architecture and buildings, but also how they intersected with social history and, and people's lives. Um, I thought that meant that I needed to be an architect, um, but I was very interested in the old stuff. And I realized that I did not have the skill set to be an architect um, and suddenly discovered, um, as, as Tracy was saying, that I could do architectural history, that that was a thing, that that existed. So I did a master's degree in architectural history. Um, and I remember my parents were very supportive of this at the time, but my dad did say, yes, that's all very well, but what on earth are you going to do with that? Um, so I did a, a certificate as part of that in historic preservation. And I think that combination of things gave me both a formal background to work with historic buildings, to think about architectural history, um, but also a good foundation in the theory and the sort of practical aspects of, of community conservation and that kind of intersection of social and architectural history is, um, is, is something that we sort of we focus on in our, in our daily lives in, in public sector work at Historic England. Um, so I started in 2001 on a one-year temporary listing inspector um, contract um, and I worked in listing for about 15 years I would say and then shifted to what was then planning and now we've brought all of that together in our regional team so I'm lucky to be able to think about all those different activities um, through looking after the London and South East region. But I'll just end by saying that, um, as I say, I started with a one year temporary contract and that was a, a big leap. Um, I was young enough at the time to be able to take that risk. I didn't have you know, sort of family commitments. I know that's not possible for everybody, but um, along the lines of, of Tracy's advice at the beginning, I would encourage that as well, that if you are able to take up short term opportunities, even if it's not your sort of full career mapped out there in your first role, it's really um, a, a good opportunity to just take up a short term role, um, helps to broaden your experience, to shape your particular focus. And indeed, in many cases, it can lead to longer opportunities once you have a foot in the door. Um, so we'll end there and we'll come back to some of the other things later. Thank you, Emma. Emily, thank you very much indeed. Um, really, I mean, I've, you know, a lot of us in universities um, think about the history of buildings, but it's really interesting to hear, your, um, hear more about your career in, in sustaining that in the present world. So that's really, really useful. I'm really, really grateful for that. Thank you. So Hannah is going to speak next. And Hannah, um, just to remind everybody, comes from the archive sector. So again, um, very much, um, very, very important work for historians. Um, um, you know, the archive sector is just something that all historians are so profoundly um, dependent on and um, rely so heavily on. So Hannah, it would be lovely to hear more from you about um, your career in the archive sector. Thank you, Emma, and thank you to uh, the RHS for inviting me. So yes, my name is Hannah, and I am the Collections and Research Manager at Black Cultural Archives, and I'll talk a little bit more about Black Cultural Archives in a moment. But um, a bit like Tracy, I didn't have my career mapped out, and I also came to my role in a slightly roundabout way. So I did um, a history and philosophy degree at the University of Leeds and then I did a master's in archives and records management. So I will talk a little bit more about how uh, you can get into that specifically later. And then I got a job at the Black Cultural Archives in 2012 um, and I worked as firstly the assistant archivist and then moving up to the archivist role. And then in 2014, uh, an opportunity to undertake a PhD at the University College London in the Information Studies Department came up. And so I took that chance to kind of step out of the formal, I guess, archival career to think a little bit more about archival theory, uh, particularly around organisations like the Black Culture Archives. And then I went back to BCA in 2019 as the um, Collections and Research Manager. So a little bit about the Black Cultural Archives. So um, the organization was founded in 1981, which for some of you who are familiar with particularly modern British history, that was a, a, a fairly tumultuous time in British history. Um, we were formed out of the uprisings, also known as the Brixton riots of the 1980s, and um, partly as a response to kind of educational pressures within the education system. So many of our founders were collecting archival material to kind of intervene with a kind of the development of heritage and kind of history narratives and founded an, an organization in which to kind of hold these histories. Um, we moved to a purpose-built center in 2014 and our address is number one Windrush Square which is based in Brixton in South London. As a fairly modern archive most of our material is from the late 20th century but we do have a variety of formats and types of material. We are uh, 
progressively taking on uh, more digital and born digital material and um, lots of audiovisual material from the late 1980s. Um, our mission is to collect, preserve and celebrate the histories of people of African and African Caribbean descent in the UK and to inspire and give strengths to individuals, communities and societies. So that's Black Culture Archives and that kind of informs quite a lot of what we do. We are a very small team. Um, I, as the collections and research manager, have two other part-time members of staff who work with me. And that means that I also get a chance to do quite a lot of different things within, um, within my role and related to heritage, which I'm going to talk a little bit about. But primarily what I do is I'm involved in a lot of strategic planning. So thinking about how to develop the collections, how to develop partnerships, how to develop relationships, both within the sector and outside the sector. So we work a lot with HE, uh, with a lot of history um, uh, departments, such as like uh, those at King's and Roehampton and uh, Goldsmiths are the kind of key, key partners, but we're really keen to develop partnerships with other heritage institutions and uh, other HE institutions to kind of think about how we can um, use our collections to start uh, different conversations about particularly Black British history. I'm also involved in writing a lot of fundraising applications. We're a completely independent institution, so we don't have any kind of core funding or a core uh, parent body so a lot of my work is around uh, funding and fundraising and thinking about how um, we can get uh, funding in our collections and one of the key things that we do is a lot of outreach so um, my colleague Aisha Johnson who uh, was going to speak but uh, couldn't uh, she is our learning manager and she does a lot of work with schools with with HE um, formal and informal education um, she's recently been working with the BBC particularly with the CBBS program um, which some of you may be familiar with if you have young children there's one called Jojo and Grand Grand um, and they did a special edition on Windrush so working with a lot of different um, uh, journalists TV thinking about different ways in which we can kind of engage people with our collections I also do some kind of curating. So I've been working with uh, Google on their Google Arts and Culture platform. So we've developed a series of online exhibits and exhibitions, again, to speak to our collections and wider questions around Black British history. Um, and I've also worked with the National Theatre. So a couple of, a couple of years ago, they did um, a small island by um, they adapted small island by Andrew Levy and we did a little bit of consulting but also had uh, the cast members come in and talk about the history of Windrush so that they could uh, better kind of inform their own understanding of Windrush. Um, so I've also I personally have also undertaken independent research with again with TV companies so um, working on kind of historical uh, dramas historical uh, programming to kind of make sure that, that they have a kind of uh, sense of historical accuracy around it. Um, in terms of, again, kind of, I've touched on it briefly, but I say Black Cultural Archives is a completely independent institution. We are a community-led organization, but the archive sector itself is really broad. So you could end up working if you're interested with um, national institutions such as the National Archives who employ a lot of researchers, um, a lot of uh, historians to help contextualize their material, or you could end up working in local government, thinking about how you can work with policy, and policy changes um, and in terms of the kind of transferable skills that I found that I had that I took into my PhD and how my, my PhD helped me gain public speaking so I do a lot of um, outreach a lot of talking like this uh, a lot of thinking about team working and how we work across teams and then obviously subject interest so developing a really deep subject interest and experience in what I um, in what I'm working with one thing to caveat is that um, whilst there are a lot of different types of roles in, in archive sector and heritage more broadly, which we've, we've heard about, um, if you end up working as an archivist in the kind of uh, bounded term, you sometimes don't necessarily get to spend as much time working with the collections as you might want to. You do, as I say, a lot of kind of uh, strategic planning, a lot of thinking about the collections, but um, if you're interested in history and making history available to people, then um, I would say the archive sector is definitely one for you. Um, again, happy to take questions and I think I will leave that there. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I, you know, I knew we were going to go off in all sorts of different directions, but I didn't expect you to say uh, to, to mention both Google and the National um, Theatre as organisations that you've worked with. That really is a, a wide um, and diverse range of different kinds of um, organisations that you, you know, that 
your position in the archive pivots out to. So that's really fascinating. Thank you very much. I'll remind everybody, um, do use our Q&A function. Um, at the, we're going to listen to Kate next, but when Kate's finished, we're going to, I'm going to, I'm here to put questions from the audience um, to our panel. So any questions that you've got about um, entering these particular, uh, these different, um, these different professions and just any questions about what, what work and life is like when you're there, feel free to put them in the questions and answers and I'll start feeding them to our panel. Um, but before we do that, before we move to questions, I'm going to um, hand over to Kate. And Kate, just to remind you, um, is working in the field of publishing and journalism and is currently the co-editor of History Today. She's also warned me that she's got a slightly dodgy internet connection, so we'll keep an eye on that. But good luck with it, Kate. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was going to say it's normally rock steady and today it's decided to play up so sorry um, but thank you very much for having me here um, as Emma said in her first introduction history today is a small independent history magazine but we're also the oldest in Britain and I think the world having been publishing continuously for 72 years now um, history publishing as a whole is a large field and print publishing in general is obviously huge the magazine publishing sector as a whole, I think is in slight decline as digital publishing is strengthening, but it's certainly holding its ground. It's not in terminal free fall, but it's not having the boom that it has had in previous years. Um, I did a quick search of WH Smith today, um, and that gave me 21 history magazine subscriptions available. Um, if we add on to that magazines who don't sell subscriptions or don't distribute through Smiths or are perhaps online only, I think that demonstrates the scale of the popularity for history writing. Um, it seems to be kind of endless appetite. Um, these magazines range from general interest and the biggest of these is probably BBC History through to niche or specialist subjects. So you've got History Island, for example, Ancient Egypt, the Armourer, Steam World. There are also newspapers and non-history magazines that will publish history content where it overlaps with their interests. So within that broad field, History Today stands in the general interest category um, as we try to publish as broad a range of subjects as possible. But then we're at the more scholarly end of that spectrum. So um, we're for the kind of hardcore history enthusiast rather than a casual reader. And there are magazines out there that are more suited for, you know, all types of reader. Um, we're a very small magazine. There are currently three editorial staff, six other people at the company. Um, we work very hard. Um, the bulk of the magazine's content is written by expert authors, so historians and researchers who are sharing their research. Um, and we commission those or we accept them via submission, edit them to fit the magazine's style and tone. Um, other magazines work differently depending on their audience, so some will make more use of freelance writers who can write more generally on a broader range of subjects. Um, some magazines produce a lot of their content in-house. I've only worked at this one, so I can't talk about the others with any kind of authority, except to say that I think each magazine will have different priorities and what they want from their editorial staff. So we, because of what we put out, have um, a high level of expertise in history, which is reflected in the backgrounds of our team. Um, judging from job adverts to other publications that I've seen over the years, other magazines might place more emphasis on editorial experience and just ask for an interest in history. I actually, um, applied once for a job at a magazine, history magazine that was just starting up. And the job was essentially for a staff writer who would write the bulk of the magazine articles on any subject. So their priority there was writing skills and just basic research. I obviously didn't get the job. Um, my background was far too specialist. I didn't have enough writing experience. Um, so history today, um, I kind of fell into this job during my PhD, which was on bilingualism in early medieval manuscripts. And then during the period of unemployment after my PhD, I did a bit of blog writing. Um, a couple of articles went viral um, and that led to writing a few articles in the national presses. Looking back, they weren't very good articles, but um, I was just starting out. Um, I also spent a lot of time on Twitter, which was a very different thing back in those days. It was much smaller. And just in the process of getting to know people and just making friends on there, I unintentionally built up a really strong network of connections in public history. So then when History Today was looking for just a low level contributing editor, my name was put forward. Um, and they took a bit of a leap of faith, I think, in taking me on, but it turned out it was a perfect fit for my skills. 
So both in terms of my areas of interest and my personal strengths, and then in the training that I'd had in academia was directly relevant. So I was interested in history. I had a knowledge of history. I was just very interested in language and writing and in how we use language. Um, and then the kind of type of research that I did taught me to have a really weird level of attention to small details. And I'd done um, proofreading training as my part of my master's and my PhD. And I had no idea how useful that was ever going to turn out to be. But thanks to this combination of skills, I essentially carved out my own role in the editorial team. I took on more and more responsibility. So these days on a day to day basis, my job involves um, vetting submissions, commissioning new authors, editing articles on every level from on every level from large scale structural changes down to line edits, proofreading. Um, small bits of copywriting, uh, some picture research, and just a lot of emails. Um, so yesterday, for example, I found myself reading about uh, the Second World War, German Romanticism, the Rosetta Stone, the Gold Rush, and the history of brainwashing, which was lovely. <laughs> um, and then at the same time as I was doing my PhD and these bits of freelance writing, again, thanks to this unintentional social network that I got uh, when the TV show Vikings was in development, I was asked by a friend who was the historical researcher on the show to provide some old English dialogue for some of the characters. And that since developed into me coordinating all of the historical languages for Vikings and now it's spin off Valhalla. So that's been going since 2013 in total. And then in 2020, I also signed a book deal with Penguin to write a multilingual history of Britain, which is huge and ambitious um, and that's what I'm working on now alongside history today. So I'd say my career path, the same as um, the other speakers, has largely been unguided. I didn't have a vision for what I wanted to do other than that I just knew that academia wasn't for me. Um, everything else that happened was just me doing things that interested me and being very lucky in the support that I had and the opportunities that I was able to take on and then prove myself in. Um, I will say just a caveat as well, um, that editing is not the same as um, doing history, that um, I'm working on other people's research um, behind the scenes. I'm not doing my own research. I'm representing the magazine and I'm helping other people's research get out there. And there have been periods where that's been a bit frustrating. And I think that's a large part of why I decided to write my book was so that I could get back into doing my own work. But I get a lot of satisfaction every time we go to press and I've produced a magazine full of really interesting research that we're putting out there for people to read. So that's great. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions on magazines, editing, freelance history writing, consulting, anything else I've mentioned here. And I hope that that was useful and that my internet didn't cut out. <laughs> The internet was absolutely fine, strong and stable, <laughs> nothing to worry about in the end at all. And uh, even more to the point, what you said was very interesting as well, Kate. Thank you very much. Um, another, I don't know, really, another world um, of kind of professional history that people can do. Lots of questions um, are starting to come into the chat, and I'm going to try. Oh, I encourage all of our, um, rather than do that, Kate, um, let's encourage everybody else to put their cameras on. I encourage the um, Kate Tracy. Emily and Hannah to put your cameras on, and we're all, all ready there to answer questions that are coming in. So um, I, rather than go through them all one by one, because I think there will end up being too many, I've, I've been looking through them, and it seems to me people are kind of coalescing around a certain set of questions. And one of them I thought might be interesting to kind of take them through from um, the uh, beginning or the earlier stages of developing an academic uh, uh, historical career to, to later stages. So there are some questions um, really asking about what people can do after they've finished their... Um, oh, Mary, if you put your um, questions in the Q&A rather than in the chat, and I'll try and pick them all up in the chat, otherwise it's a bit difficult to keep track of everything across both, both areas. So there are questions about um, the requirement to do an MA that are coming in. Um, so Becky Morgan, for example, I've recently completed a BA ons in history, um, oops, uh, history and public heritage. I'm interested in going to archiving genealogy. I'm a mature, I'm a mature student. Um, is an MA compulsory um, for the roles that I'm interested in in the archives and heritage sector? And somebody lower down has really asked, if we use the Q&A rather than the, um, the, the chat function, it'll be a bit easier for me to keep track of your questions. Um, 
are the routes into the heritage management archives available to people who've only got a BA or do you have to have a master's as well? So thoughts around that, I'd be uh, very grateful to hear from you. I can take this. Um, so the MA is not um, necessary, but uh, at least the postgraduate diploma is. So at the moment, there's a um, uh, the Archives Records, Records Association, which is our professional body, um, accredit a number of different courses, um, and to kind of have that archivist level experience, or to be able to go into a role as an archivist, as an archivist, generally um, there is a requirement to at least have the postgraduate diploma, but not necessarily the full MA if you really have an MA. Um, but this is uh, an issue that the sector is really well aware of, that this kind of setting up these kind of barriers. So there's been a lot of work around thinking through different access routes. So where I am at UCL, we're thinking of, also at UCL, they're confusing. Um, uh, we are thinking through a little bit about kind of what some of these additional um, routes look like, but at the moment the P postgraduate diploma is if you want to be, as I say, formally kind of get a role as an archivist. But as we've discussed, there's lots of kind of alternative and side roles that you could do and you could kind of slip in with, with, with the relevant experience. So some of the things that we've been talking around is actually getting getting that experience, which also can be quite difficult if you don't have the qualification, but maybe others can kind of speak to that as well. Yes, if anybody else, just take your um, mute off and speak to it if you'd like to, otherwise I'll move on. Um, yeah, so I Sorry, I was just going to add to that. I would say um, a, an MA is not essential. I mean, I'm talking mainly for the, um, the kind of straight heritage rather than um, archival, but um, it's not essential um, at all. In fact, I would almost say no particular qualification is essential. And I say that because um, if certainly from a curator's point of view, uh, we do have people, we have a lot of people who did history degrees. We have some who didn't do um, history degrees at all. We have others who've done MAs. So it's a real mixed bag. Um, having said that you don't need an MA, but um, I would like to just put out a little um, advert for an amazing MA, should you wish, um, in heritage management. Historic Royal Palaces actually now runs its own MA with Queen Mary's University in London, where it's a two-year MA and you study part-time and you also get lots of vocational experience at the palaces so you're actually working at the tower of london hampton court kensington and the rest um, and it's a fantastic way of both getting the qualification but then getting the experience and we have such a high strike rate from our ma graduates of um them going into a exactly the sort of career that they wanted to because they've got that experience while studying thanks tracy and emily were you going to speak to that as well Thanks, Emma. Yeah, I mean, very much as, as Tracy said, I'd, I'd say within across historic England, um, uh, a number of a number of colleagues do have master's degrees. Some have PhDs, but it's certainly not required. And increasingly, we're thinking about um, having relevant experience. So I think we often even don't say that even a degree is required because we're thinking about getting a wide range of experience within the organisation. So if someone's worked in the local authority for ten years, um, in a way that's going to be a lot more useful to us necessarily than having a, a, a really high level degree. So it's that we are we are broad and diverse in terms of um, what we look for, and it's it's about kind of experience and, and expertise rather than a specific um, level of um, formal education. That's really interesting to hear that it is um, possible to get your foot in the door um, on the basis of a history degree um, and solely on a history degree. Um, I, as, as you said, Hannah, it does raise barriers when we, uh, although we're all in the business in universities, we're in the business of providing people with as many degrees as we possibly can. It can also um, risk raising barriers. There's a problem of, uh, of a different kind. Um, I, I, related to that, Janice has said, is a PhD now considered really important to gain a role or can experience um, be enough? And I think, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed over the past decade or so is there certainly is uh, more of a trend for people in the, um, the glam sector, for museums, archives, heritage, to have PhDs. So I wonder if we could just um, think about that from both angles. I mean, I'm clearly hearing that it's not absolutely fundamental to have a PhD, but then I'm wondering, I mean, we'll have many in the audience who are working on PhDs. It would also be very interesting to hear what are the advantages of having um, a PhD um, Anna, you've um, had the job in archives and you mentioned that you've been doing a PhD as well. So it'd be very interesting to hear about what that brings to somebody in these sectors. Yeah, sure. Um, I think aside from the formal archival qualification, which I spoke about, having the PhD 
in is so important around specialist knowledge of the subject so because i work in an organization that is highly specialized in terms of black british history i'm um, having that time to go away and just really think about um both some of the kind of archival questions but the, the actual history and knowledge of that is so important and um, and i talked about really briefly but actually being um having been through the phd process and understanding the he sector is, a, is able for me to then understand a what phd students might be might, might need and how we think about what kind of services we can deliver for he students and phd students particularly but also kind of understanding the broader sector in terms of who we could work with how, and how we can work with them and some of, I said some of that kind of strategic policy thinking um that you kind of gain whilst you're uh, in in the kind of phd world is so important in terms of I say, for kind of my role around kind of bridging the historical information and making access to that really important and really and that, that's the big thing I found most useful is kind of bridging those two sectors which sometimes don't necessarily come together in that way. Hannah, um, yeah Tracy go ahead. Yeah I was just going to say that um, yeah it's certainly you know it's definitely no bad thing if you if you have a PhD or you're studying for PhD. Um, in my team at Historical Palaces there are a number of curators who have gained a PhD and certainly I personally found it helpful because of the um, the expertise you've developed whilst studying your PhD particularly if it relates to then the organization you work for and also the skills of research have proved incredibly helpful and those skills are, are the ones that I very much picked up whilst studying for my PhD at the same time though I am going to say that it's not essential um, and, and I hope that's a running theme in that often I, I speak to people who are really anxious that they've just shot themselves in the foot by not doing the right kind of degree or, or not doing a degree at all and actually you know that there, there isn't one hard and fast rule um, for careers in heritage um, and also there are a number of members of my team at um, HRP who are studying for a PhD whilst working as um, as curators so that's another option you know you don't have to kind of do an either or you definitely don't have to have one before um, it's useful if you do but there's always an option to gain one actually on the job. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's quite a few questions that are coming in around um, publishing literary agents, so I'll just park those for a moment and just before we move on, um, there are a few questions um, for you Hannah, so one of the questions is uh, did you have to have an MA uh, to join the sector and I think we've heard no you don't have to, but somebody has also asked, um, Finlay Padwick has said how did Hannah in particular get into the field of archival work, would there be other organisations to look out for opportunities, so do you want to say anything more about how you ended up um, uh, from his, you know, how you how you ended up in the archive sector, what your route was? Again, slightly accidentally. So I did um, my uh, history undergraduate at uh, Leeds, and I was thinking I left. I was hoping by the time I left, I would have a clear path, but no. Um, and so I was just kind of looking around and thinking in a few um, traineeships with being advertised in the library at University of Leeds. I didn't get any of them, but it kind of uh, opened my eyes to other similar career paths. And then I was really fortunate that I was, I was in Leeds at the time and I was able to volunteer both in the Special Collections Library at Leeds, but also at the National Railway Museum in York. So a museum that has an archive and a library. So kind of getting that uh, kind of wide variety of experience. Um, no, uh, I don't wish to offend anyone. Uh, railway history was not for me, I decided, but um, I, I really still enjoyed the process of working with the archives, even though the actual uh, train formation was not necessarily for me. Um, and so from then I realised that, yeah, this was definitely the career, that, at least, that I was interested in. And then I was then really fortunate to get a job at Black Cultural Archives later down the road, and then that really kind of sparked my uh, passion and interest in Black British history specifically. So it was, again, a kind of slightly, it was my end goal. So I guess, um, as Tracy said at the beginning, looking out for in, uh, organisations and institutions that you're interested in, uh, firstly, seeing um, what kind of opportunities they have. I know that at Black Cultural Archives, we offer a variety of volunteering um, experience internships and um, we also work with other organizations who run formal internships and so some informal internships as well and then um yeah just kind of getting as much experience as possible Be because of the kind of need to then take on if you want to become say 
qualified as an archivist, but as, as Tracy said, it's not necessary. Um, there is a, an, an expectation that you understand a little bit about the field and understand some of the kind of um, work that you might be doing. So um, yeah, just kind of getting as much experience as possible. Um, that's kind of how, how I did it. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you ever so much. So we've got some questions. Um, we'll, uh, just a little bit more on work experience, which you mentioned there, Hannah, and trying to, you know, the, the getting the foot in the door. Um, I've had a question from somebody who's uh, not yet started undergraduate study, but there's also questions um, coming in from people who've done degrees. Um, and there are similar kind of set of questions about how might I go about finding volunteer or a kind of a, a, an opportunity? How might I get started? Um, where, where is there, a, is there a website we can look at um, for work experience or for internships or any kind of particular bits of advice there? Um, I'm not aware of a, a kind of umbrella um, website that covers volunteering experiences. That's not to say that it doesn't exist. I'm sure it does. Um, but um, if you start with the sort of major organisations, then usually on their websites, they will detail volunteering um, opportunities. Certainly, Historic World Palaces, we've got a kind of volunteering team um, who manages that and we put out opportunities on our website and the National Trust and um, and English Heritage, well I'm talking about English Heritage in my day when I was there, but have huge volunteering um, opportunities um, as well. Um, uh, but apart from that, I mean the way that I got in was as I said just looking at specific sites and organisations that I wanted to target and just contacted them, contacting them and be prepared for um, as it was uh, in the dark ages when I was doing this, um, many rejection letters. Now it's probably rejection emails, but it, you only need one to say yes. And you might just get in touch with them at the right time. Uh, and so, you know, do, do, you know, be proactive and actually contact these places. Thank you. Um, great. Look, um, wonderful to see you um, all talking to each other in the chat. Do use the chat if you've got answers of your own to share with the audience. Do use the chat for that. But if you've got questions that you would like me to put to the panel, please use the Q&A, not the chat, because I can't keep an eye on both of them at the same time. So I do think a few questions have popped in there. Just copy them over into the Q&A. Um, and I'm trying to keep on top as many questions as I can in that place there, and I'll put them to the panel. So a few questions have come in around... Um, uh, the writing aspect of um, history. Um, Jessica Border said, are there good literary agents um, that one might go to? And others have asked, um, how, how, could we, how can we start? How might you start to pitch something, for example, to history today? Um, oh. Thoughts there? Well, I, I won't answer the history today one <laughs> because um, I, I would just like to sort of say what I did in terms of book publishing there is a very very helpful directory called the writers and artists yearbook and it lists all agents literary agents by uh, specialism so those who, who publish history uh, science whatever it might be um and that i would say that's a really good place to start um and um and, you know there's so much information online now if you just google literary agents you know history or whatever it might be and i really would say as i i said in my kind of brief summary at the beginning that um the the very the best path is definitely to get an agent first don't try and go straight to a publisher with a an entire book that you've written um because if you are lucky enough to get a book deal that the publisher will want to shape that book um you know it's, it's incredibly rare they get thousands of manuscripts every year it's incredibly rare that they will just accept one of those manuscripts um and, unless it's come through an agent but actually to get an agent um, you do need to be prepared to do a fair amount of writing because an agent will only take you on if they think that you know you've got the potential so um, to develop a proposal for a book you might actually have to do something quite meaty um, I certainly did when I did my first book proposal and I had to include um, kind of sample chapters um, so the whole thing ended up being about 25,000 words uh, which felt like a slog I can tell you because I was writing this not knowing if it was ever going get, to get into print uh, but it's so worth it because once you've got that first book and if it, you know if it does well um, then you don't need to do that ever again you know just a three-page proposal will suffice um, for, for other books um, so it's definitely worth putting in the miles uh, to begin with. Yeah, thank you. I really agree about the um, agent offer. I remember Donna Tartt hearing her on the radio saying, 
Um, she did get her first book published on a first attempt, but she spent a very, very long time getting an agent. So the story gets completely um, misrepresented uh, because she spent years trying to find an agent and that was the tricky thing. Um, but Kate, yes, we've certainly got questions about pitching your work to a magazine like History Today, but also just kind of first steps and first approaches to get your work, um, your historical writing published. Yeah, so um, again, sorry, my internet is really playing up, sorry. Um, so pitching to magazines and newspapers is quite an opaque process if you don't know anyone um, who works there already. History Today has a web page, it's historytoday.com forward slash submissions. And we have an outline of the types of articles that we publish, the different lengths, um, and there's a contact email address there. and tell us a little bit about yourself and outline your idea. Um, probably don't write the article in advance and send it to us because if we don't want it, then you've wasted your time. You know, not wasted your time, but you've written work that we can't necessarily use. Um, we might want more information, um, in which case we'll get back to you. Um, we might say yes, write out. Um, we might say no, and there are all sorts of reasons for that. We might have published lots of things on that subject already recently or, um, we feel it's kind of a bit too familiar or it just doesn't kind of, you know, it's everything is a fine balancing act across the magazine, trying to work out what we want to publish. Um, other magazines, I had a quick Google this morning. If you Google how to write for BBC History, they've got a page with their contact details on there and any magazine that accepts articles via submission should have similar. Um, the other writing opportunities I've had have been I've through me knowing someone or someone recommending me for the opportunity. Um, but yes, hopefully that helps, but I can say more if needed. No, thanks very much, Kate. I think again, I think um, there's a lot of um, doing quite a bit of the work on your own time and then taking it out into the world and see how far you can um, how far you can take it. And I think that clearly is a theme that's coming through. Um, we'll take a pause on the hour but whilst uh, your internet connection is stable Kate I'd love to put this question from Rebecca Williams to you it was interesting mm -hmm. to hear Kate's comments about feeling frustrated over editing other people's research oops keep on um sorry I can't tell if it's my internet playing up or no 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 that's me I had it and then my um flicked on the computer and lost it. Anyway, she's asking about the balance. There it is again. Um, the balance between working outside of academia and how that relates to doing your own research and how far, uh, how you manage to keep your own research going whilst, and I think it's relevant because I mean, the others um, in the room are also clearly doing um, their own research and put your own research agendas as well. But how do you keep your own research going? Is it something that you can do whilst you've got a professional career um, outside in editing or perhaps in the archives or museum sector? Um, how do you balance that? Um, so I only work at History Today currently two days a week. Um, I was on three days and then when I got the book deal, I stepped down to two days so that I could devote more time to doing my own research. Um, so that's how I do it. And then for the first couple of years while I worked at the magazine, I was doing a postdoc and I did both of those part time alongside each other. And it's just about trying to be quite regulated with my time and switching off my History Today emails when I'm trying to write my book, which I'm not very good at. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just trying to keep a balance, really. Um, and it is quite tricky doing my own research and having to put it on pause to then go and do a magazine day and then pick up all the the mental threads again and get back into it but it's the kind of the compromise you have to make when you're doing both things at the same time yeah that's really interesting i mean of course it is quite similar when you're in universities as well and you've gone off and end up being very busy with parts of the university job for long periods and lose the threads of your own research and then you're in very similar um business of trying to pick them back up again um tracy you obviously are juggling the writing the research and the career as well. Have you just got anything to say before we pause? Yes, um, I'd like to say that it's it's quite often chaotic and you can guarantee that every single strand will get busy at the same time. Um, but what has worked really well for me is that um, as a Tudor historian, I'm very fortunate to 
be working um, mainly at Hampton Court and the Tower of London. Um, and I do find there is more than a little overlap, really, uh, in terms of the sorts of areas that I need to research for HRP and the, the, the kind of subjects that I'm writing about as well. So um, obviously, you're not always that fortunate to actually work in a specific part of history uh, that happens to be uh, bang on what you want to be researching as well but when you do I think you've struck gold because you know it, it just all tends to kind of work together that said I have to be incredibly disciplined because I work for two days a week for historic royal palaces uh, the other three days although it's never just three days um, in theory are for writing and and broadcasting and giving talks uh, and the writing time gets squeezed and squeezed and the research time as well and I have to be really really protective of it if it's in my diary then nothing else can can get in there otherwise I would never write any books at all so discipline I found is very very important I'm sure so and Hannah you you oh sorry Emily go ahead I was, yeah. I was just gonna add I mean not nothing like on that scale but it is it is yeah it is a really hard difficult balancing act um so and I and I work full-time for Historic England so the, the the book thing is kind of um well in the middle of the night I guess or, or not <laughs> which is the problem um, it takes a long time when it's when it's sort of not directly related to your to one's work it's worth saying that um in mean, the thing about the heritage sector of is that it's notoriously not very well paid, but there are other benefits that come with it, including a, um, a relatively high annual leave um, amounts within the public sector and also um, professional development opportunities within the organization that one can apply for, as well as paid study leave after a period of time. So after, I can't remember the exact numbers, but after about five years, you can apply for two weeks of study leave. So in theory, I've, I've got a lot after 20 years, but um, of course, one never ends up taking it when you, when you do certain types of jobs. But anyway, it is possible. Um, and it is, as you say, just being just being really committed it has to be done in one's own time. But once you have a bit of time, I find, and get stuck into it, then it, you can kind of you know, fill, fill the evening hours more happily. It's just when you have a break because of work, then it's very hard to get your head back into it. So I think that that balance of those two things is really, really challenging. But um, people on the call who will have been in higher education, of course, will have those um, have those kind of study skills and, and time management skills very very much at their fingertips so it could be possible absolutely i mean it's part of the training of the humanities degree is time management skills and study skills and discipline and it's really interesting to hear you all say yeah i just have to use the old trident tridentistic test techniques there's nothing else and it is exactly the same in academia where you're obviously being pulled in all sorts of directions at the university and you're trying to keep your research going as well. I mean, it is more factored in, but that being stretched um, is also very, very familiar. All right, we've reached the hour and we're going to take a pause for five minutes. There are many questions that have come in and we're going to use the second half um, really to feed questions to the panel. So I will take the next five minutes to um, read as many of these as I possibly can and try and um, figure out how I'm going to put the majority of them um, to our panel. But everybody else, take a break. We'll be back at five past. Um, Thank you very much to the panel. Fascinating to hear from you. Um, see you all again in a moment. Hello and welcome back. I'll encourage Tracy and Kate and Emily and Hannah to put their um, cameras back on. Lovely to see you all. I have done my best to look through these questions. There's so many and they're so diverse. Um, I don't know how I'm going to um, put... <laughs> I'm going to put them all to you. I don't think I can. Um, but um, lots of really interesting things coming up. Um, so I'm just going to get started with feeding out some of the things that I think are really worth thinking about. Um, one participant has said something. I'm watching a lot of bloggers and clickbait undermine actual historic history, particularly from young, ambitious, recent grads and those who value conflict entrepreneur trends um, and more in this vein. But I'm wondering um, if there's um, this participant has 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 highlighted something that we haven't said very much about. Kate, you mentioned it a little bit about um, blogging and the use of Twitter and the use of social media to um, develop a, perhaps a profile as a historian. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that can, that can be done for ill, but maybe there are ways in which people could also use this as an opportunity um, to uh, launch a career um, as a public historian. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I mentioned that I started kind of, I started my career on Twitter, basically, and it was a very different thing. Now, basically, 
most historians have some kind of social media presence and I know that because when I'm looking to commission an article I generally find the person on Twitter. <laughs> um, blogging I would say is very useful for um, honing your skills um, and learning how to write in a different way for a different audience um, in terms of then wanting to use that as a jumping pad into more formal kind of published writing. It's very um, useful to have that, but it's not necessary. Um, a lot of our contributors haven't done anything like that before. They've just done academic writing and that's fine. It, you know, it varies from person to person and it's what you want to do. Um, if you want to build up a career in freelance, Oh, we've lost Kate for a moment. Um, your main mic us out. Yeah, just for a moment. We just lost your last sentence, Kate. Try the last sentence again. <laughs> yeah, it just says your connection is unstable. Um, yes, um, if you want to make a living off just freelance writing, um, it's not very well paid. Um, a lot of people, specifically in the history magazines, are competing for very few slots and History Today, for example, um, we don't like to repeat the same contributor too frequently, like two articles a year from the same person is probably our max. Um, so, and the articles aren't very well paid. Um, you know, we pay as much as we can, but it's not going to keep you going for months. Um, but you can cumulatively build up a few things in different places. Um, and I'm sorry, I think my connections may be too dodgy to carry on with the answer no not um, at all no Kate we're hearing you absolutely fine don't worry about it okay <laughs> great thank you um with a, another part of that question I haven't answered I got so distracted by the internet <laughs> it's very distracting when you see that those yellow bars saying it's not working we heard you fine and that was a very helpful answer thank you Kate okay. um, <laughs> um I would said, say sorry. oh yeah I'm oh, sorry carry on um if I didn't answer specifically do feel free to contact me afterwards or email me or something sorry yeah, no absolutely fine for the moment absolutely fine so um related to that and i mean you mentioned that the the money that the pay can be quite poor i think i said getting in and getting on relies on a lot of unpaid work temporary positions part-time work um to dedicate to independent research is that viable in today's economic climate it seems like a barrier and social mobility problem for the sector i mean i hope there are and i, I think i am hearing that there are opportunities to get into arts um, and humanities and historical careers without unpaid work, I think that um, I think that that, that is possible. Um, but I'd love to hear from the, the contributors around that. Anyone um, wants to speak to it? Yeah, I mean, I I tend to um, kind of veer towards optimism in this respect because I kind of think obviously that you know we're, we're hearing a lot about the cost of living going up. Um, at the moment and indeed it is going up a lot um, but I think it's always been a challenge um, to get the experience you need whilst actually um, you know getting the money you need because um, certainly when I was starting out in heritage I had to do an awful lot for free I had to just kind of volunteer or um, what I would say though is that there are lots of um, kind of seasonal positions um, in heritage, uh, paid positions, I should say. Um, and even if, um, you know, you're getting a, paid for something in heritage that isn't the kind of thing you want to do, the main thing as an employer, I can absolutely attest to this now, the main thing is to get that organization's name on your CV, even if all you've been doing is filing for six months or um, something that you know completely isn't uh, matching your skill set you get that organization on your cv um, and and so focus on doing that and on kind of working your way up it is a challenge um, but i would say there are so many different um, kind of avenues open now um, so you can be writing articles, doing perhaps seasonal work at heritage um, organisations. Um, there are numerous opportunities kind of online as well. Um, that, so, um, yeah, it's difficult, but I think you kind of got to start somewhere. Um, and if you're prepared to work hard and perhaps um, have a paid job that's got nothing to do with what you want to do, uh, but sort of build up the experience out of hours, then I think that's going to be really in your favour. Emily? 
Thanks. Yeah, we've been thinking a lot about this as an organization, as a sector, because I, I, I completely take the point that um, you know, if, if things have to be done in an unpaid way, it's very hard to get one, one's foot in the door. We've actually been um, quite guarded about work experience and volunteering opportunities for that reason, because we feel that they're often they're available to those who are you know, otherwise supported and might have the right connections to get in. So we've been trying to equalize that a bit by doing things like um, three days work experience for, for young people that's available to everyone you can just sign up and it's a really sort of intensive online um something we started doing during covid opportunity to hear from a wide range of experts and sort of how they got in so um and i can circulate the link for that we also have a number of paid placements um that we've been working with central government to think about funding for um just for that reason so that people have a period of six to eight weeks of a, of a paid role in the heritage sector with a wide range of backgrounds and these are particularly targeted at, at sort of underrepresented um uh, communities and individuals in 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 the heritage sector so there's as it was a small drop in the ocean but i think they are really meaningful opportunities that we've actually kept people on for jobs afterwards or given them a sort of a route through to other bits of the sector it's worth thinking about volunteering things though that they don't also kind of to tracy's point they don't need to be long-term kind of a year-long volunteering role they could be short small things that you do in your own time even something as small as what we call enriching the list, which is adding photographs to um, the online list of historic buildings in your neighborhood, which is something that doesn't take a huge amount of time, but demonstrates an active engagement with heritage um, and it's something that you really can sort of slip into the crevices of the day rather than feeling that you have to contribute months of sort of unpaid time towards the sector. So it's good to look for opportunities in your community that um, sort of show engagement in this area and sort of put that alongside as um, just as Tracy said, perhaps you know, paid work in, in an un, in undirect field and then think about sort of merging those things together. Um, but I'll, I'll post some of these links because hopefully they'll be um, useful to, to you and others on the call. Brilliant, thanks. Kate. Yeah, yeah. Um, I said it's all low paid, and it is. Um, but you should always be paid if you are writing for a publication who is then going to be making money off of your work. Um, and the same goes for consulting for TV and radio shows. Um, TV is very keen on phoning you up and asking for a quick chat on your research, and then not paying you for it. But you should always be paid, and they should have a budget for it. So. Um, again, I don't kind of agree with kind of making use of people's goodwill when you're kind of making money off of it. So that's something to bear in mind if you're trying to get a foothold. While exposure is great, make sure that you're you're not being taken advantage of there. So yeah, have that. yeah. Thank you, Kate. Very good reminder. I think you're fine with a uh, camera on, so feel free to leave it on, and it's much nicer having you present in the room. Uh, some questions have come in about other people at different career stages um, and not everybody in the room is um, in their early 20s at this point and just starting um, uh, an undergraduate degree or just finishing or early PhD stage. We've got people at all sorts of career stages and they've got different, they've got, you know, picked up all sorts of different experiences. People have mentioned IT and data management. Um, I'm just wondering, um, the panel have got things to speak to on, um, you know, mid-career, people joining these sectors mid-career and what particular challenges um, might face people at mid-career level. And equally, what are the, you know, what are the other, how does one make an advantage of the fact one's already lived a, you know, got professional experience in another domain? How can, how can that be kind of um, channeled towards these kinds of opportunities? Um. So certainly at Historic Royal Palaces, we get a lot of applications from um, uh, mid-career um, or mid-careerists, I don't know if that's a <laughs> correct phrase, uh, but people who have, have come a bit later to um, history or to heritage. Um, and what we look for there is some kind of proof that they're not just bored doing what they do and, and just kind of fancy a change. We need some kind of proof that they are really dedicated to now changing their career to working in in history. So whether that's by having taken some kind of qualification um, in history or whether that's by, again, gaining some experience um, through through volunteering or through um, kind of seasonal work. Um, it does really help to actually kind of back up uh, rather than just saying, I've always had a passion for history. That's that's something that that's kind of appears in a lot of applications. Um, I, I guess you need to kind of prove that that's the case. Um, and I think it can be a positive advantage, actually, to come in 
um, mid-career um, you because often that's real proof and testament to a genuine commitment to the subject and to a career in the subject because often they've really sacrificed you know a successful career doing something else in order to pursue their passion and they really go for it then and um, we've had some fantastic people come through um, at exactly that stage of their careers by just kind of having the courage to change and do what they've always wanted to do um, and so um, I, I don't see it really as a huge disadvantage at all um, so long as as I say there's some proof that you know it's a serious commitment. I just yeah add um, within the broader information management sector with which archives sits within there's a huge need for people with diverse skills so particularly around questions around um, data infrastructure data architecture di digital the digital like those are things that the sector are still thinking about so anyone with those transferable skills around understanding IT infrastructures and architectures is definitely needed and then around some of the more information management people who have a customer service experience I know the places like the National Ar Archives are looking at people who have user um, UX user engagement experience knowing how to build websites and build CMSs and things like that all of those skills are so needed because at the moment um, we're dealing with people who come from an IT background and don't necessarily understand heritage or people who understand heritage but don't necessarily understand IT. So being able to have people who are changing careers who understand the needs of both. So sometimes we use the same language but we mean very different things. And um, like Google Archive is basically just putting your emails somewhere slightly different. Um, but yeah, so I think like those, some of those um, other skills are so vital in the broader sector not just necessarily that kind of specific archive and heritage, um, archive and history uh, place. So yeah, if, you look, if you're interested, places like the National Archives, the bigger institutions are actively looking for people with those kind of different skill sets and those different knowledges that people bring. Thanks for Hannah. There are there were actually actually specific questions about um, people in the audience with an IT background wondering how they might um, position themselves here, and it's very interesting to hear you say we need people from IT backgrounds. Um, go for it. Um, brilliant. Um, there's some some questions um, about um, suggestions for a literary agent. I'll just put out here that um, we work at the Royal Historical Society with Andrew Lowney's literary agent and many many literary agents but I often encourage people if you're interested in looking for an agent go to Andrew Lowney's website because he's got really good information about kind of how to get started there are other agents out there and once you've found one you can kind of go on and find others um, but he gives you a lovely kind of uh, a kind of outline as to how to get started and how to approach agents that um, can be a little bit opaque to others but the audience uh, sorry the panel might also have things to say about literary agents and just going back to the theme of writing as well um, that I know almost all of you are engaged in in various different ways um, one contributor asks well when when you're writing your books how do you access the historiography the cost of academic books and articles is ridiculous and when you don't have institutional access it's a major barrier to producing high quality research um, so I think that that is an interesting question when one leaves universities one of the great advantages of a university is you do get access to everything um, that your library subscribes to when you're outside the university how do you still access um, this material or, or, or how do you manage without the same kind of access? How do you navigate that one? Should I um, just yeah. uh, on that? Um, yeah, of course, it is a challenge and, and it's easy to take that for granted when you're in an academic institution, you have access to all kinds of, of journals and, uh, and archives. But um, that said, there's an awful lot um, available now for any researchers. Um, and um, I would put in a, a bit of a, pitch for your local library because um they're amazing now and, I've, and i'm probably very slow to or uh, late to the party on this one but it's actually thanks to the rhs that i got connected to my local library online which then connected me to a huge range of online research material during lockdown when i couldn't get out um and, and it was it was very very difficult including um the oxford Dic dictionary of national biography for example the national archives are fantastic in terms of the uh, the digitized resources state papers online as well um so and and they're by no means unique in that the british library as well uh, there's an awful lot that's been digitized and is freely available so yes i'm not downplaying it is a pain 
um, not to, to have those subscriptions ready, readily available, but there's a huge amount of free resources out there to get you started. Thanks, Tracy. Um, I believe the IHR, the Institute for Historical Research in London, also has free membership for anyone doing historical research. So that might be a useful resource as well if you can't access things. Also, if you come, if you are coming out of um, an academic institution, there's always the um, alumni access. So quite a lot of institutions offer alumni access. Some of it might be on site, but you could also try alongside the local and national libraries. You could also try your institution and see what kind of access they can provide. Um, but just want to say, a Black Cultural Archives, we really think about knowledge equity and open access, so really trying to make sure as much of our material is available outside of paywalls. And um, our library is also, if you're very interested in Black British history, uh, also freely available. You have to come to Brixton though. It certainly is a challenge, isn't it? Um, interesting to hear that you're all thinking about it. Um, Questions about, um, oh, I think it's been jumping around. Where did that suddenly go? Um, I had a question about, oh, historical consultancy. Um, I think this is something that people are interested in generally. How do you get into historical consultancy? Is it a question of just building up your reputation? Um, can you seek this kind of work out? Um, I would say that um, they tend to find you. And the more you're, you, and, and today that means an internet presence, so I do work on the Industrial Revolution and people want to say something about the Industrial Revolution, they find me on the internet. Um, so getting your, uh, so you put yourself out there, not necessarily as a consultant, but as somebody who knows something about this. And from, but that's been my experience um, as somebody based largely in a university doing other things. But I wonder if the audience also have things to say about cons consultancy. No, no worries if nobody wants to speak to that. Um, one other thing that's come up is podcasts. Um, and again, that is a different set of skills to anything that anybody's doing directly here. Um, anybody got anything about podcasts that's then? Just shake your heads if not. There's so many more questions I can um, run through. Um, In what sense? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, just as a way of getting your history of producing history, really, for people to mm. produce history and putting it out into the um, public domain, a way of being a historian whilst not necessarily being employed inside a university. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, I've 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 been on some podcasts. I wouldn't say that I've uh, I'm a podcaster, but um, it's a really nice. Sometimes it's a nice way of uh, if it's an especially like an informal chat. Um, it's nice to kind of as a way to think through and talk to people about your work. Um, again, at Black Cultural Archives, we have um, an organisation who are in residence, and they also produce podcasts based on our collections. So we also think that's a really interesting and important way, again, of kind of getting uh, information about the collections out there in kind of lots of different different ways. Um, I was just going to say, I found this a huge growth area for me. I'm getting a lot of requests now to take part in podcasts. And actually, um, it's one of the things I most love doing because you can often have far more in-depth chats or, or, you know, about very, very specific pieces of research because there are, um, you know, millions of different podcasters out there, all on quite kind of niche subjects. And so um, it's it's a kind of opportunity to nerd out on various things. But and I also love the international um, nature of it as well. So I'm you kind of regularly do podcasts um, in the US, for example, but I've also done them in Germany and Australia, as well as the UK. Uh, so I think they're a fantastic way of um, tapping into your research, but also obviously if you're a listener, a subscriber, then then finding out more about your research interests. But it does feel like it's expanding at a rate of knots now. I'm, I, I've really noticed a huge increase in, in the number of um, podcast invitations. So yeah, also, yeah, to, to speak yeah. to Tracy's point, I do, uh, personally, I find podcasts uh, a really uh, satisfying way of learning things because you can just listen as you're doing other things and then kind of just absorb things that you're interested in as well. Absolutely, as you do the washing up or whatever it is that you've got to do, you can be productive at the same time. And we've run these kinds of sessions um, for many years and five or six years ago, we might have had somebody who produced radio documentaries for the BBC. I'm talking a little bit about how you might pitch 
um, a history program or a you know, radio program. And it was always very um, difficult, a bit demoralizing because you know that you pitch so many things and the great majority of them never get accepted. Even if you've done good programs in the past, it's still extremely difficult. So you know when you're giving, speaking to this kind of audience um, that you can give all the best advice in the world, but still it's going to be very, very difficult for people to ever pitch something that will then appear uh, on Radio 4 on the TV, but podcasting does mean that it is now possible to share our history. So I think the world has changed quite um, dramatically over the last few years with the podcasting. All right, um, we've got some questions um, around, uh, I've got a question here from somebody called Stephanie. I've just finished my PhD and I'm trying to decide whether to turn it into an academic or a trade book. Um, so we've got a number of trade authors here um, we can't, I mean, no, nobody can answer the question as to which is the right thing for you, Stephanie, or which, which path you're going to go down. But I wonder, it'd be lovely to hear if we could, um, about writing trade books and about the choices that the um, authors on the panel have made about going with trade and the advantages that's brought to them. I'm happy to go first if that, if that helps. Um, I would like to also challenge before I start um, the distinction in that, um, yes, of course, there is a distinction of audience um, between, um, I'd probably prefer to say sort of popular history um, and academic history, um, in that the, the latter tends to be written in a different way. Um, there's much more about historiography. It, it's, it tends to be much more specialized, although I'm generalizing here. Um, and obviously the name suggests popular history is for a more general um, audience, but, um, I get quite annoyed about this, I must admit, because um, I would say the academic rigor behind both is it is and should be um, pretty much the same. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's an assumption that somehow if you're writing popular history, it's not as well researched as as academic history, and I would absolutely challenge that. So obviously, your decision um, depends on the sort of um, audience you would like for your uh, for your work, and also um, perhaps the subject, whether you think it is a, a popular history subject or whether it is more specialized. Um, but yeah, I would just like to use that opportunity to, to, to challenge the, uh, the, the kind of conception, which I hear a lot, that popular history isn't as academically rigorous, because I think it, it can, and it, you know, it should be, and it is. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> There's a difference in terms of what you might want to accomplish by publishing the book, because um, trade books aren't peer reviewed or eligible for, uh, I don't know if they're eligible for the ref, I'm too far out of academia now, but um, it depends whether you want to kind of use it as part of an academic career or not, and that might influence. But yeah, as Tracy said, my book's kind of original research and stuffed with footnotes and um, original arguments and things. And I'm in a kind of borderland between trade and academia with Alan Lane that they do publish a lot of kind of scholarly history. Um, so yeah, it's not a hard and fast line. So I think it depends on what you want to do. I do find there's a difference for me personally in writing that um, academic writing for me and the kind of I like having a bit more flexibility with, with the freedom of writing in my book, um, but that's a personal preference. Um, and there are academic books that are fantastically well written. I just didn't think that the kind of work that I was doing within academia would let me write in that way. As I mentioned before, very detail orientated and nitty gritty. Um, so um, it changed when I went to a trade focus, it changed the way I approached my research and the kinds of things I was writing about. So. There's a difference there. Thanks, Kate. Um, Emily, have you got anything to add? I know you're writing as well at the moment. Um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, a much smaller scale than others because it's just the one thing, and it's um, it's with our what used to be our in-house publisher, but now Liverpool University Press. So in that sense, it's a kind of more accessible book. It's sort of highlighting the buildings, um, but putting a lot of narrative around that. So I think if it's um, yeah, if it's a particular focus on a, on a sort of building type or a sort of asset type or the contribution that makes to sort of public history in this country, then that's one route to look at is um, Liverpool University Press, which, um, yeah, we work with very closely and really accessible, interesting stuff. 
Thank you. Yes, I mean, I think, um, you know, there's, everyone has to make their own decisions about where to publish. If you're um, looking for a career outside universities, it's hard to see how um, academic publishing is going to be awfully useful and helpful. Academic publishing is very helpful in progressing an academic career, but trade publishing can work inside universities as well. So I think inside the university, both trade and um, academic publishing can work really well. Outside universities, um, it's harder to see the value of academic publishing when you're outside the university sector. I'm sure there will be some exceptions to that, um, but that's certainly um, what I see. Um, so I'm also getting some questions here about the, um, the PhD and balancing the PhD. So um, several of you have done um, PhDs. Could you talk a little bit more about how that works, conducting a PhD whilst working in heritage? How common is it? And also about the, the nitty gritty, the funding. How does one, uh, you know, are these PhDs funded? Is time allocated in order to undertake a PhD? Um, any advice for the kind of practicalities of working in heritage and doing a PhD as well? Uh, mine was actually, I did it full time. So I completely um, left BCA and um, whilst it was on BCA, it was very confusing. But um, so I yeah, left and I was really fortunate to get um, to get funded. Um, otherwise I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, but at BCA, we are thinking a lot about more collaborative doctoral awards. So we're doing one now. Um, and I know that National Archives also do a lot of collaborative doctoral partnerships or awards with, with um, higher education. So if you're in heritage, you can do that kind of balance between the, um, the PhD and the work and seeing how those two can kind of feed in together. Because I think that for me, that was the really important part of doing the PhD, that it wasn't just, um, not that PhDs are, but it, it wasn't just an exercise. It, in doing it, it was actually think it is time to think about my practice and think about the history and how then that can feed back into into my role. But that was my kind of um, that's my experience. I know that um, funding is ever increasingly a hard to find, and also the kind of st the stipend levels are particularly low at the moment, um, which is a problem. Um, but yeah, I, I can't really speak to kind of what the current practices are. Um. I was just going to add on that we've got a couple of uh, different examples at historical palaces in that um, some of our curators are um, studying part time for a PhD, which they are they have sought funding for entirely separately from HRP because we don't as a general rule fund um, PhDs, but um, we sometimes um, have secured and we have currently secured um, funding uh, to actually offer PhDs. Uh, to uh, people for subjects that relate to the palaces. So, for example, we've just advertised a wonderful um, PhD opportunity on the history of chocolate, um, because there was a chocolate kitchen at Hampton Court. And you might imagine we had a lot of applications for that one. So it's definitely worth watching out for um, an adverts on the on the Historic Royal Palaces website, hrp.org.uk, um, because if we do have a funded PhD opportunity, we always advertise it there, and I tend to tweet about it as well. Thanks. I just add that we have similarly a Historic England, I can paste the link up, but it, it, it occasionally advertised for collaborative um, doctoral partnerships, so and, and a wide range of subjects. They've traditionally been quite sort of prehistoric and a number in the maritime field, but increasingly some in the more modern period we're looking at sort of potentially kind of post-war architects, women architects in the post-war period, things like that. So a range of interesting um, topics across the heritage range. So I'll, I'll post that as well. Thank you. Yes, uh, that's very clear and it's very evident inside the universities as well at the moment that more and more PhD opportunities are being made available through these partnerships with heritage organisations, the collaborative doctoral awards. Um, I think they are now about a quarter of all the PhD funding in the U UK. So there's really quite a lot of opportunities um, to, yeah, the, the whole sector has been quite geared up towards supporting people to do um, research degrees whilst also developing the career skills that are needed there. So there's quite a pipeline and they're all quite well funded so far as um, studying is ever well funded, but it's, it's not badly funded at all. Um, we've also got some questions about, um, well, we've got a question here, for example, I'm interested in working in heritage or curation, I'm volunteering in a museum, I'm doing a placement, um, but it's quite difficult um, 
uh, Lily tells us about uh, to, to get a placement at the moment. What are my um, opportunities? Um, people hold on to their people hold on to their jobs in the sector for quite a long time, so there aren't always vacancies. Um, and I wonder if we could just speak a little bit more um, broadly as well. It was one of the um, ideas that we were thinking about when we put together the program for this about the current state of recruitment in the sector um, and, and and how recruitment basically works inside your sector um, and. The, 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 whether that's a bright future for our, I guess at the moment for, for recruitment. I can perhaps um, speak to, to this Emma. Um, we yes I mean, as ever you might expect in, in the public sector public sector funding is not um, not kind of readily available and increasing. However there is um, to the point that people kind of keep their jobs for a long time, there is quite a bit of turnaround. Um, colleagues moving on to do other things or having a career break. So we do we do have a fairly steady flow of recruitment for you know, replacing existing roles, um, sort of key roles within the organization. The inspector for historic buildings and areas, for example, that's a sort of a standard kind of inspector post. Um, and there's a pretty, a pretty steady, steady trickle of those available as well as um, um, other sort of heritage roles. That's looking at listing or, or business support. And grant giving. So I would um, certainly encourage looking at the Historic England website for those opportunities when they come up. Also across Twitter, we're always really keen to advertise those widely um, and, and, and share those. And one of the things that I'd probably um, demonstrate is uh, encourage you to demonstrate in applications is sort of the, the applicability of, of, of life experience and other roles to, to what you're doing, and particularly coming out of um, higher education, is thinking about you know, demonstrating how you're know, learning to construct just a good argument, learning to understand the significance of something from a wide range of you know, huge amounts of material and sort of distilling down to the important salient points about the significance of the building, for example. I mean, those are really practical daily used skills that are essential for an inspector of historic buildings, for example. And those are things that you'll be well versed in from coming from higher education, communication skills, you know, dealing with nervous cross owners, dealing with worried developers. You know, these are things that we use day to day, which might not be immediately apparent from your, from your recent Degree, but actually with a skills that you can very much bring to the fore in the application. So I would really encourage um, sort of thinking broadly across the piece when applying so that your application stands out because we do obviously get a lot of applications for the roles, but, um, but we are broad and inclusive in terms of who we choose to interview. Um, and so you know, bring, this, bring those skills to the fore, I encourage you. Thank you. Okay, so I've got quite a lot of questions coming in um, from people who are studying for PhDs at the moment, and they're asking specifically about getting published. I know we've covered some of this material before, but still quite a lot of questions coming in about getting um, published in trade magazines. We've come back to the history today again, Kate, how to get published, how to um, get involved in historical consultancy. Um, TV and media, what are the things that people might be able to do? I mean, I guess they have two different um, sides to this question. What are the things that people might do at the same time as they're publishing their PhD to prepare themselves or to, to make themselves um, equipped for these kinds of um, domains? And how do you actually go about doing it? Getting published in particular is one that's still um, cropping up a lot in questions. Um, yeah, so I mentioned before the submissions page for History Today, so I'm going to just talk about History Today here rather than other places. Um, so basically in a pitch we, uh, we want to know not just the broad shape of your research but actually specifically what you want to say in this article and think about how it would work as a ma magazine article which is a very different beast from um, an academic article or an academic piece of writing, um, it needs to work for someone who doesn't necessarily know anything about the field. Um, our readership is historically literate, but there we wouldn't assume kind of expertise on any specific subject. Um, we do three lengths of articles, there's short ones which are a thousand words, um, and that needs to be, it's quite a specific skill writing for those, um, quite focused self-contained story, they often have some kind of contemporary resonance, but we don't necessarily ask for a hook, like it doesn't need to be tied to an anniversary or to something that's happening in the news today. Um, there can be resonance, um, but it doesn't need to be explicitly stated. We kind of let the reader make those comparisons themselves. 
Um, and then we have features which are 2,000 or 3,400 words. Um, and those are more in depth. They can tell more of a story. They can be a bit broader, but they still need to have some kind of focus and core to them. Um, we get a lot of pictures that are very big and unspecified. And we say, well, actually, I think I just want to focus in on this one thing, go more in depth with it, tell more of a story with it, um, rather than trying to include as many things as you possibly can be, you know, selective and focused. So kind of think about that when you're writing your pitch to us. Um, and as I said before, you know, we can go back and forth and work out the shape of it. The article won't necessarily be perfect in the first draft, or we'll go back and forth and edit it. Um, or we might say this idea is not for us, but, you know, come up with other ideas and pitch to us in the future. Um, there's kind of no winning solution to guarantee your article being accepted, but um, just kind of, yeah, read some articles on the website. The, the short ones are all free to read um, and subscriptions. So you can get a weekly subscription quite cheaply and read 72 years of history, get an idea of the kinds of things that we publish. If you want to write for a different magazine, the writing style will be different and the scope of the history that they cover will be different. So think about how your work would shape itself to fit a different audience in that magazine. Um, and so we get a lot of pitches that would make a great article, but they're just not right for history today. So kind of think about where you want to write and why you want to write for that publication in particular. Um, and yeah, if you're not sure, you know, we're just people reading the pitch at the other end of the email. So, you know, feel free to say you're not sure or that you um, would appreciate guidance and we can kind of work on it. So hopefully that helps. It's very helpful, Kate. And um, other questions coming in around um, the step towards writing a book as well. People are asking, is it helpful to try and get articles or shorter pieces published um, on the way to getting um, a book contract and publishing a book? Um, are there other forms of writing that might be a, a good part of one's training and apprenticeship, Casey? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I, th I think I've mentioned right at the beginning that um, writing shorter pieces is a brilliant way of then ultimately getting a book deal. And that's um, certainly what I did. And I started out um, writing for history magazines um, and um, and just writing kind of short pieces that I could potentially show um, an agent um, because you know they do need reassurance that you can actually that you can write but now of course there are things you know like blogs and lots of websites on specialist subjects um, so as a Tudor historian you know there's a plethora of, uh, of websites just dedicated to Anne Boleyn just one of the six wives of Henry VIII um, so for example and they take guest articles um, they have um, you know they're very open and and able to be contacted so that's another way of getting your writing out there start small I would always say that but also don't spend too long agonizing over it just get words on a page about something that interests you just get because I can find a million excuses not to start writing really um, my house will be very tidy on the day when I'm supposed to be writing because I'll just immediately go off and do other things get words on a page it doesn't necessarily matter if they're not the perfect words um, and uh, you know get your writing out there that's lovely thanks i will also add to that um quite a lot of authors that i've published have since been approached by agents or directly by publishers off the back of a history today article i mean not it's not a guarantee but it certainly does happen and i know a lot of agents kind of keep an eye on history magazines i think i got approached off the back of a blog post i wrote by an agent once i didn't end up going there but there people are paying attention so yeah if you're putting your work out there um it all helps thank you yeah it's quite the, the, the more you're out there the more you do it the more people will just find you when they want somebody to comment on this that or the other and I think that a lot of it comes back to that doesn't it um switching from the publishing to the curatorial and the museums and archive sector finding voluntary experience is really difficult Helena writes in a curatorial context I've had both paid and unpaid jobs in museums and archives and visitor services and marketing. Um, would you recommend getting experience or what kind of experience would you recommend is needed specifically for curatorial roles? Um, is it sufficient, I, I wonder, to, to just have some kind of um, foot in the door experience with different um, museums, galleries, 
um, or are there specific roles that are going to be much more useful um, in terms of getting um, professional employment, say at the end of a PhD? Um, if I could just uh, start, I would say I absolutely um, sympathise with this at the moment, because what I found is, pers um, particularly after the pandemic, uh, the opportunities are in such great demand for work experience and for you know voluntary work because you know people have not been able to do that on site for for quite a long time um and so yeah i i completely i'm not going to pretend that it is easy because it's not easy though it's you know we've uh, historical palace has got a big backlog of people wanting work experience that said for curatorial um i would say that you know don't worry about specific experience just get heritage experience because um, it's it's all helpful. You, you're you're working in the right environment, and at um, HRP we certainly offer the opportunity. So, for example, some of our seasonal staff um, they sometimes take secondments for a few days in the curatorial department just to, to kind of get a flavour for the work that we do, or they 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 shadow us. So, just if you can, just get in there, get any opportunity you can in a heritage organisation. Um, and once you're in, it's so much easier then to make connections with the actual um, specialist department that you really want to work in. Thank you. Um, yes, and I've got people saying, well, I've had one placement, but I'm still struggling. Should I do another piece of voluntary work? I think clearly this is the message that's coming through very strongly, isn't it? To get in and to do anything, um, regardless of whether it feels quite the right um, thing for you at that time. Um, many more questions about work experience. Can you give me more examples of the type of work experience that we could get to work in archives and roles other than actually being an archivist? So, I mean, Hannah, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to some of the work that's around um, the straight up and down archivist. Um, you've already mentioned that you really do many other things. <laughs> sure, yeah. So especially because BCA is a very small organization that we have voluntary roles across the whole organization but so within um within the archives uh department specifically we do a lot of um, volunteering around transcription so we have a lot of oral histories so getting to grips with um doing transcriptions catalog tidying up one of the things i think um that we spoke to emily at least emily spoke to is being really mindful of when getting people into volunteering experience that we're not taking advantage of them so we do limit to some extent what volunteers can do versus what interns or kind of paid members of staff will do but a lot of it is around kind of the supporting and we also sometimes have volunteers um support us with with, with making making small exhibits um so they might uh, do some uh, picture research or some copyright clearance things like that where there's a framework around it and they're doing some some of that work but we're kind of managing it what else do volunteers do and um, we have um sometimes we have exhibition invigilators so people who can who can come in and just kind of watch the space for us uh, particularly if we've got uh at the moment we've got an exhibition that has objects which are out and touchable but obviously we want people to not walk away with them uh so things like that and um, we have some experience with marketing so it, it just depends so yeah um but within the within my uh department specifically it's around kind of the collections management so reboxing listing material when it comes in so uh, in terms of the cataloging process we get material in we list it so we know what what there is and then it gets catalogued so a lot of a lot of uh, uh, opportunities to do that kind of uh, engagement and kind of looking after the material before it kind of goes through cataloging processes um, and that's pretty standard across at least the archive sector around kind of coming in and supporting the work of the archivist without necessarily doing the work. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. Yeah, very much. I think it does. Um, we've only got ten minutes um, left. It's in, uh, the, I've got this kind of porridge. You know that story about the porridge pot feeling with the questions. They just keep coming, and it doesn't matter what we do. We still kind of got around forty questions, and we can't get through all of them. There is a lot of overlap, so I hope we've covered as much as we possibly can. But apologies to everybody who we couldn't really um, address your questions specifically. We've got time for just a few more, um, and I think um, there seems to be a kind of a set of questions about um, what one, how what one might structure one CV, um, and what kind of person. Um, you're looking for um, um, and how people ought to kind of go out and present themselves. So um, Joshua Dyke says, for example, academic ones want you to showcase your publishing, publishing in your education. Um, and he's asking about kind of uh, joining um, as a mid-career 
um, joining any of these professions at mid-career rather than earlier. I mean, as, as an academic, we're not interested in all the other things that you've done, Rina. I think it's very true that we have a very narrow read on the CV. We want the CV to tell us where you did your PhD, what it's about, where you've published, and we don't really care how, you know, your, your, the, the things that you may have done before are going to be often a little bit less interesting to us, depends a bit on the role, and there are exceptions to this, but we, you know, we are very focused on the publications and the teaching experience and things like that. I'm imagining that um, many of the fields that you're from are looking for more rounded individuals and are more interested in the, the, the rounded things that people have done, so I just wonder if you could see, say something about what kind of things you're looking for on a CV, and again this links to some, many of the questions that are coming in, I'm doing my PhD at the moment, what else should I be doing? in order to get myself ready for the career at the end? Um, thoughts on that rather um, large question. Go ahead, Emily. Happy just to start with that, Emma. I think um, just from recent rounds of recruiting, I think the things that strike us beyond looking at kind of one's most recent work experience, um, jobs that one's done, is, is those extra things that one's done in the in the community or in terms of heritage work at home. So if you're a member of the local history society or if you've done some work with your local local list or the conservation area advisory committee in your area. So that kind of stuff really stands out because you're demonstrating practical experience in the heritage world that's beyond um, the very specific nature of, of, of your degree. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to emphasize. And then the other point I would make is the one that I've mentioned before, which is about sort of emphasizing how your real life experience, which might not be directly related to heritage or history, has uh, puts you in a strong position to be able to fulfill the major kind of um, job skill requirements will be, which will be set out on the on the job advert so the kinds of you know, analytical skills or engagement with the public or customer service whatever the specific skills we're looking for if you can really demonstrate how you bring those skills even from a different field I think that's another way that particularly stands out so those are the, the two pointers that I would make from a historic England perspective. I, I agree um, what so quite a lot what things that we're looking for is some of those attitudinal things mainly also customer service and team working and how you can demonstrate that um, and to be quite honest organizations like to feel special so um, that you genuinely want to work there and that you understand the organization you may not have the experience but going back to some of the things I said earlier that, that you again you you understand what's required you understand what the organization is about because that becomes quite clear quite quickly if someone is going through the process and not to say that you know you know people we are aware people are applying for the jobs but just kind of in thinking through how you're telling your cv or how you um if you're called to interview that you you have been through the website at least and that you understand what you're getting you, you might get yourself into because uh, recruiters will ask and will quite clearly see sometimes if people are just kind of going through the the motions of it so um being quite mindful that you come across that you actually want to work there because otherwise then you might not get through very true when it comes to writing up the job application even in universities we we like to think that we we're different from the university down the road and that's why you're applying to us we know that's not the case we know you're applying because it's just a job that you can apply for but make people feel special definitely any other um, thoughts on developing CVs and how to pitch yourself or, or what um, you're looking for as in, and we've had a lot, um, I mean, Kate's spoken quite a bit about pitching, it's a slightly different thing, pitching your work to the article. I just want to trace if you've got any final thoughts on CVs and um, self-presentation for the sector or oh, Kate as well. Yes, um, I would say, and, and at the risk of repeating myself, but, but as employers, um, we really do look for, you know, a few relative um, related organisations that you've worked for. So regardless of whether that's in a voluntary capacity, regardless of what you've actually done there. So don't, you know, just stress too much about getting exactly the right job for a particular organisation, but just some kind of affiliation to, to an organisation that's relevant is what we look for. Um, and, you know, a nice personal statement at the beginning, keep it brief. Um, and, um, I would personally say avoid um, something along the lines of I am passionate about history because um, that's what everybody says. Um, uh, perhaps better to say proof of my passion for history is that X, Y and Z, this is what I've done. Um, but yeah, I would say if you're able to keep your CV to a single page, that helps because um, particularly for you know, the more desirable jobs in heritage, you know, we're talking about hundreds of applications. Um, so, but really, really proofread it carefully 
um, because um, that's probably that's not meant to be patronizing. But it, you know, it, it can be off-putting if there are if there are kind of typos in there. Um, but otherwise, include the experience briefly on the qualifications, any publications, but try and keep it to a page. Thank you ever so much. Um, Kate, you popped your mic off a moment ago. Did you have anything to add? Yeah. Um, just very quickly, um, rather than pitching, if you're thinking about applying for editorial work. Um, Proofreading is absolutely a must, uh, specifically if you want to be an editor and be kind of in charge of other people's writing. Um, show how you're interested in history, because again, everyone who applies to a job says I'm very passionate about history. Um, and we would specifically want a demonstration that you have experience of writing or editing for non-academic audiences, because they're very different things. Um, and we get academic CVs that are fantastic academic CVs, but they just don't demonstrate the skills that we want. And there are a lot of people competing for publishing jobs at the moment. So that's what I would be looking for specifically. Brilliant, thank you. Well, it is two minutes to the hour, so it's time to draw um, this event to a close. Um, first and foremost, I must say a really big thank you to all of our speakers. It's been a really fascinating, a really engaging, conversation. I think it's clear from the um, just the, the quantity of questions coming in that people have been very, very interested to hear what you're saying. And I'm seeing claps <laughs> vanishing up the screen. Um, clearly, I think it's been a very, very useful um, event at all. And I'm very grateful to you for giving up your afternoon to speak to us. Um, I'd also just like to take a moment to remind everybody in the audience that we um, run a regular set, oh, there's all sorts of things going up. We've got happy faces people laughing, all of this is fun. Uh, I'd love to just comment on the fact that we've had so many people from all over the world. It's been lovely to have our global audience as usual. We've been very focused on getting a career in history in the UK in today's um, um, session. So I hope those of you from other parts of the world managed to get something out of the conversation as well. And just a reminder that everybody, uh, many of you will be here because you're already involved in the Royal Historical Society. But a reminder to anybody who is not, we have a range of different membership categories and we have a home for everybody, for people who are starting a first postgraduate degree, to everybody who has finished a PhD, you might be interested in joining the Society as an Associate Fellow, to those who've published books or working professionally, you might be suitable for our um, fellowship category, and for those who are just uh, embarking on whatever kind of education or career they have, or if they're here just through an interest rather than um, a, a career in history, we have a membership category. We have categories for everybody. So look at our web pages and do get involved and do um, become a member of our organization if you can. Thank you very much, Adam, for popping that into the chat. And um, it just remains for me to say thank you. Um, and I hope uh, very much look forward to seeing some of you at another RHS event soon. Thanks everybody and goodbye. Thank you.